youth engagement, social trust, and why it matters to democracy. I want to start with this uh, cover of Time magazine, which actually was the cover after the Enron debacle, which you may recall back in 2002. And I use it because, for me, it frames the whole question of where are we going as a society and what should we be thinking about in terms of the future of our youth. So what it says is so many choices and no one to trust. In today's world, you're on your own, baby. Um, now, this was before the more recent, <laughs> uh, as we all know, we're sharing in the collective uh, sacrifice of the financial sector. Um, but for me, it illustrates that we need to be rethinking the whole social integuments uh, of where we're going as a society. Much of the social contract that was true from the New Deal has broken down. Mostly what's left is Social Security uh, and uh, programs for the elderly. Uh, and we have very little in terms of things like the GI Bill or, way, or Pell Grants, ways to educate and incorporate the younger generation. So we really, essentially, many of the programs that those of us in the baby boom generation were used to, that is, that when you got a job, there were retirement benefits associated with it. When you got a job, there was health care associated with it, have been privatized and individualized. So in fact, Time Magazine is right. Increasingly, even for people who get jobs, they are on their own, baby. Um, and that doesn't make for a very trusting or democratic society, OK? Actually, I'll just say as an aside, Paul Krugman wrote in the, in the few days after we all learned about what was happening on Wall Street that you know, when, a, when a mortgage fails in the United States and then uh, Iceland goes under as a country, it suggests to us we're all in this together. And we ought to start thinking about what that means and what both uh, collective opportunity and collective sacrifice should mean. Uh, so this little comic captures the notion of social trust. So he says, the son is saying, as I grow up, should I trust people? Or are people out to get whatever they want, no matter who they hurt? And the father isn't too eager to take that question <laughs> because he's confused himself. These are the ways in which, for the last really 40 years, national surveys have measured the concept of social trust. So just think to yourself. It's, it's a question about how you feel about humanity or people in general. Would you say that most people can be trusted or you can't be too careful in dealing with people? Would you say most of the time people try to be helpful or they're mostly just looking out for themselves? And do you think that most people would try to take advantage of you if they got a chance? Or would they try to be fair? So it's this generalized view about whether others um, are basically people like ourselves, trustworthy, fair, ready to pitch in, OK? Now, the reason people care about this is that in national surveys, if you look from 76, and I don't have the very most recent years, because they're actually not all uh, 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 up there in data yet, that, that, that in general, the population has been declining in terms of their beliefs about humanity, OK? Actually, when this was first asked, it was around 50% of the people felt that people could be trusted. It's now down you know, to 20%. Um, the, the big concern is not only is this a social good, that in democracy you want a fairly high level of trust in the population, the, uh, the issue is that it's younger generations more so than older generations who don't believe people can be trusted. So something has been happening in the course of younger generations growing up, what sociologists and political scientists call generational replacement. So as the World War II generation essentially retires and then dies off, it's Gen X and the millennials who are replacing them as part of the body politic. So the question is, what's going on, OK? Now, I, I, I was saying to Ann and Dale, it's amazing here in Minnesota how many people actually are doing work that's highly relevant to this question of engagement and trust. 
And uh, uh, John Sullivan actually is, um, I think, in political science here. Somebody can uh, uh, correct me any time. But they wrote a fantastic article when John Transu was his graduate student called The Psychological Underpinnings of Democracy. And essentially, they were making an argument that you can have laws, and you can have institutions, and you can have constitutions, but you need certain kinds of dispositions in people for really rule of the people to work, okay? And they nominated two that they said were the really key, key things that we needed in the population if we were really going to have a working democracy. The first was political tolerance. And by that, they made clear that was not apathy. That was not, you can do anything you want to do and I don't care. It was really that I support your right to differ with me, okay? That your opinions matter, even if I fundamentally disagree with you. So, and th the reason this is relevant to social trust is that people who are politically tolerant are open-minded, defend the rights of minorities to free speech, and are highly trusting of others, okay? That sort of set of dispositional characteristics goes together. The second, they said, that was imperative to have as a disposition in the population was political participation and engagement. I mean, you don't have a rule by the people unless you have the people engaging. So the sort of notion that there's an ethic, there's a desire to participate in community affairs, to join organizations, to vote, is essential sort of disposition in the population. Again, that's highly correlated with trust. So people who believe the best in humanity, that they're fair, that they're trustworthy, are highly likely to join organizations, to vote, to participate in public affairs, okay? Um, now, I, I put at the end there just something I hope we can take up later is that in, the, in the trust literature, there's a distinction between trusting others and being gullible, okay? So there, it, it would be naive of us to totally trust Wall Street or, in fact, the government, okay? Holding others accountable does not mean you're mistrusting, <laughs> okay? But, uh, so, so, there, so there, we want to have a distinction between the two. But the other point I want to pick up, and I'll pick this up at the end, is that the notion of participation and trusting humanity is highly related to the sense of public hope. And I, by the end, I want to distinguish that from private hope. So you can have a sense that your life is going well, but the world is going to pot, okay? Public hope has this sense that we can change something together. And there's an aspirational aspect about the future, okay? So trust, social trust is necessary to have that sense of collective or public hope, that we can make things better, a sort of collective optimism. Now, just to get into some of the developmental work, what I want to argue in this presentation is two things, and these are the kinds of issues we've been exploring in, um, in several of our studies. That, there, that, that social tr most of the studies, I should back up, most of the studies have been on social trust have been by sociologists, political scientists, even economists, and it's almost all on adults. But if you think about beliefs about humanity, I mean, just think about working with children. Wouldn't you think there's something that happens before you're 18 <laughs> that has to do with what you believe about others, okay? So there's been a real dearth of research on what's going on in development um, that might be related to it. So for this group, the whole theme of engagement, the theme of after-school programming and community-based organizations in schools, it's, for me, the institutions of civil society are the context in which social trust is or is not uh, being developed. So what I want to argue in this presentation is that there's a relationship to two major things that's going on in youth development, <clears throat> in the course of development, and that is some basic sense of values, okay? So again, if you go back to what holds us together as Americans, there's an ardent commitment to self-determination and freedom that we pride ourselves in. There's also a notion of equal opportunity and the rights of people to disagree. So what we've looked at in our studies are, are a value cluster which we call civic equality. So the extent to which you will say, it's important to me that I defend the rights of others. Uh, what it means to be to me to be an American is that democracy is for everybody. 
not just the freedom of me, myself, um, but of everybody to participate. So those sorts of values are highly related, we believe, to the development of social trust. The second, and we have a whole series of studies on the notion of social responsibility. So again, we mostly study in developmental psychology, are we raising individuals to be responsible for themselves? Do you pick up your clothes? Do you make your bed? You know, do you put away your things? Do you do your homework? But in fact, if we're going to be a society that works together, we have a responsibility to one another. Okay, and uh, what I want to pick up on in this presentation is that when we think about health and we think about a whole lot of things, peer relationships, kids do not just take responsibility for themselves. They take responsibility for one another and we need to think about that as a resource for democracy. The second developmental foundation I want to argue of social trust is that in community-based institutions and organizations, we enable young people to develop a sense of themselves as part of the public. So we use this term, the public. What it means is we the people, sort of the first, the first words in our constitution, okay? That's not something you can teach as content. That's something you have to develop as an emotional connection. What does it mean to be part of we the people? And what I want to argue is that in public schools, in community-based organizations, and in, again, somebody from your university, has used, Harry Boyd, has used the term public work, when we are doing things together, okay, um, when we are operating in collective and solving our problems, when we are part of the student body at school, um, we are developing a sense of what it means to be part of the public. And that affect of our emotional connection is what then motivates us for the rest of our lives to pitch in. We have a notion of what it means to be part of the common good, okay? Okay, so I'm just going to go sort of a little briefly through these various studies. And almost, I'm not going to tell you a lot about who's in them. Basically, uh, these are a number of different studies we've done over the years. Uh, almost always there with um, a range of ages. Sometimes they're longitudinal, sometimes they're cross-sectional. But the respondents in these studies are usually children starting at age 11 and going up through age 18. So it spans the adolescent years, okay? Um, and it, so what we asked in this study was open-endedly, can you just tell us in your own words what democracy means to you, okay? And then we coded their answers. So they say in their own words what it means. We coded their answers into notions of individual freedom and rights, majority rule, which, which typically is more like the textbook explanation, okay? It's a type of government uh, where uh, you elect officials to, um, to represent you. But the thing I want to pay you to pay attention to is the stuff in orange. So what I'm going to argue is that kids who think about democracy in an individual rights freedom way versus those who think about, this is a kind of tip of the tongue statement, okay? Think about democracy in terms of civic equality. So they say things like, to be a democracy, a society must let all of its citizens have equal rights, okay? So what occurs to the children is, uh, is civic equality values, uh, or what occurs to the children is individual rights or freedoms. None of these are incorrect answers, so that's not the point. The point is sort of what's the most salient thing in your mind when somebody asks you, who are we as a society? What is, a de what is our democracy, okay? And then we ask a series of uh, scales about their values, okay? Both their family values and their personal values. And I'm just giving you a, a, a short description, a representative item. When you think about your life and your future, how is important is it to you to make a lot of money, okay? Uh, help people in need. And these are just items that represent a whole scale, okay? So it's a materialist scale or an altruist scale. And then when you think about what your parents tell you, how important, or, or my parents have warned me that people sometimes take advantage of you, so that resonates with the notion of mistrust. Uh, or, in our family, we try to recycle. We care about the environment. So again, thinking of public goods, okay? And all I'm going to show you here, on the x-axis at the bottom, are the scales from one to five. So th to the extent that you're high on this scale, you have endorsed the thing at the bottom. So on mistrust, the red line are the people who most endorsed 
uh, mistrust of others, okay? Uh, the, 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 again, all the way across, the highest line are those who endorse materialist values, altruist values, and environmental attitudes, uh, uh, values. The main contrast I'm trying to uh, uh, emphasize here is the way kids think about democracy, and just look at the individual freedom versus the equality, the red versus the yellow, and go across to the extent that you say democracy reflects individual freedoms, people's rights to do what they want, you are more likely to say you mistrust others, okay? You are more likely, compared just to the civic equality, uh, that, those are the only two contrasts I'm making here, okay? You are more likely to hold materialist values for yourself. You are less likely to hold altruist values. I want to contribute to the common good. You are less likely to say your family emphasizes environmental values, okay? These are not huge differences. They're all statistically significant. And really what I want to emphasize is across a set of studies that the way we are raising children in terms of their own values has a lot to do with the kind of society we are collectively creating, okay? Um, okay, now here's another one. Just, uh, this is a different set of kids. Again, there's, there's always several hundred young people involved in these studies, but in your own words, can you tell us what it means to you to be an American? And then we code these open-ended responses. It means I'm free to be an individual, to make my own decisions, to have power and success. Or it means to be part of a diverse society and respect others, to protect minorities' rights, to, to have constitutional guarantees like uh, freedom of speech, et cetera. Now, I, I, I will say, because I know it'll come up in the questions, these are not mutually exclusive, and often kids give multiple things, but I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to sort of just simplify to make an argument, and so we do also code for multiple. Um, then we have a set of scales about immigrant, your attitudes towards immigrants. And again, these are representative items on strongly disagree to strongly agree scales. So if immigrants want to be part of America, they should act more like Americans, <laughs> whatever that is. Um, immigrants tend to bring crime into the United States, therefore they pose a threat to us, or immigrants enrich the culture of the United States. And these do, the, the, the multiple items do form into these factors, okay? So um, kids endorse these items and then um, they, they, they form scales for us. And again, what you're seeing in terms of the pink and the dark red are the kids who talk about being an American in terms of individual achievement and the kids who talk about what it means for them to be an American in terms of civic equality. And what you can see across these three in terms of their attitudes towards others, immigrants, is that those who emphasize civic equality are less likely than those who emphasize individual achievement to say that immigrants should become more American, that they threaten American culture, and the equality group is more likely to say that they enrich American culture. So again, in terms of where we're going as a society, who we are as Americans, we're arguing it's highly related to the values with which we're raising our children. Okay, now I just wanna move over to a discussion of this collective identity, we the people. So Snoopy is trying to get into the theater and they apparently don't let dogs in. <laughs> So, each of the kids is saying to the authority in charge, let him in, he's our friend, okay? Um, show a little compassion. So, for me, it really captures this notion of solidarity, okay? So what if he's a dog? He's our friend. <laughs> let him into the theater. Uh, so, what I want to move over is a discussion of the notion of social responsibility and collective uh, identity. And this actually comes uh, from a, a national anti-drug campaign. And I can't read these exactly, but what they're saying, what what's going on in the kid's mind is, my friend seems to be doing something that I perceive as dangerous. It'd be kind of embarrassing for me to speak up. But then it's not about me. It's about our friendship. It's about his well-being or her well-being. So I need to take some action, okay? And, We've used this because we, we have a basic longitudinal study that we're finished with now looking at under what circumstances um, will young people intervene in the actions of their friends? When is friendship, when are, when are kids allies in prevention is what we call them. Because so much of our prevention work 
thinks about health as if it's done by individuals in their own best interest. And so much of what we tell young people is if your friends are getting into trouble, get away from your friends. Now, I, I know very few young people who are willing to get away from their friends, okay? They really would rather help their friends, okay? We think about peer pressure as a completely negative uh, construct, okay? What peers do is pressure one another into bad stuff. And as Sheila was saying yesterday at the Department of Ed, there's a huge literature and a lot of evidence that young people pressure one another into things that are pro-social. Uh, and we just don't pay enough attention to it. <clears throat> so what we haven't taken advantage of is the ways in which young people might look out for one another in risky situations. We, in fact, know very little about when and uh, if and when they do. Okay, so here I want to just point out that the theme of connection, of incorporation, of engagement, is highly related to individual health. So the ad health studies, and again, these are people here at the University of Minnesota who analyzed some of these data. The ad health is a national study, a longitudinal study of um, adolescent health. And I think one of the key findings out of that is when young people feel connected to community-based institutions like schools, like after-school programs, like they have adults they could go to to talk in their community, it is a huge protector against a whole range of health risk behaviors, okay? So the argument is that connectedness, engagement, uh, is highly related to your ability to um, uh, protect yourself, okay? Um, it is also the case that connectedness to institutions is highly related to building the stock of social trust among young people and, and, and generally. One of the strongest correlations in the uh, literature on adults is that being in organizations is, rather than being isolated, is highly related to higher scores on social trust, okay? People call it a virtuous circle between engagement and trust, that trusting people join organizations and being in them uh, may boost their trust, although there's, there, there, there's some difference of opinion on that. What we have been arguing in our studies about young people, and we've actually found this in, in some longitudinal work, that in, when, when kids say, uh, kids at our school feel like they're really part of the institution. They feel like they matter. They feel like the adults here pay attention to them and we have a sense of pride in being part of this place, this school. It boosts their levels of social trust over time. So last year, what you felt about humanity and whether they were trustworthy, okay? Controlling for that, you have an increase in whether you feel humanity is trustworthy if you say, teachers at our school insist on civility, they won't let us bully or disrespect one another, and kids at this school feel a sense of pride in being part of the institution. That actually increases the likelihood that you think humanity is trustworthy. So if we care about building the stock of social trust, uh, we should pay attention to what's going on in institutions like schools, and this would generalize, I think, to community-based organizations generally. Do kids feel that they matter, that, they, that, that, that adults pay attention to what they have to say, and that there are standards of civility that adults insist on? It's not okay that anything goes. That's not what makes for a civil society, okay? There are certain principles of tolerance that bind us to one another. We don't have to agree we have to respect one another's rights to disagree, okay? Okay, now just to say something about friendship, because I want to move into why friendships aren't enough, but I think friendships are a core basis of learning about trust. What do you, what do, what do, you do in friendships? You keep promises to one another. <laughs> you say, I got your back. Uh, I'm there for you, okay? At the same time, sometimes our friends disappoint us. And that's an essential part of trust. We don't need trust if people are always predictable. It's the fact that each of us is free to decide for ourselves that makes trust necessary, okay? So sometimes our friends disappoint us and they aren't so loyal. If you think about teenagers, sometimes they talk behind your back, okay? And that's disloyal. And, and that is very upsetting because you're the one who trusted them and you're vulnerable in the process. But basically what you learn in those unhappy situations is that trust means 
that other person is free to decide, okay? And I think that's an essential thing to help kids unpack, okay? And that sometimes we get hurt, even by people we care the most about. It also, I think, friendships teach us a lot about interdependence, okay? And that we are responsible for one another. So we can't make it in this world alone. It's, that's a reality. We need friends. We need people who care about us. And that's, it's not enough to have parents who care about us. You really need peers who help you sort out uh, what to do in life. And the, and the mutuality of interdependence uh, that is true in friendships really teaches a lot about interpersonal trust. And I think there are aspects of trust that are really, whether it's social or interpersonal, uh, true to the phenomenon of trust. The last thing is that you learn that you have to be a trustworthy friend, okay? You have the freedom to disappoint your friends, okay? But in doing so, you have abrogated a relationship, okay? If you haven't lived up to the expectations that others have had of you, if you haven't been true to your word or loyal, um, you've abrogated a relationship of trust, okay? So, but what I want to emphasize is that the interpersonal trust and social trust are not one and the same, and why we need different kinds of experiences in kids' lives. Because friendships, what draws us to one another tends to be similarity. We're comfortable with people who are like us, and they are our friends. When you ask kids, why, young kids, why their friend, we do the same stuff together. We like the same stuff, okay? Um, but social trust really means we need to think about a wider circle of other people. Friends, friends are great for learning about it. Friendship isn't enough. And in the adult literature on social trust, where the big debate is about being in organizations is, is it enough to be in a bird club where everybody's a birder to build trust? Well, probably not, because the diversity of that group and the reason that you come together uh, doesn't build your beliefs about humanity in general. It's other birders, but unless you're in organizations where there's a wider circle of diverse others, there's not a lot of reason to think about its capacity for building the stock of social trust. So here I really want to get into the potential of volunteer work and a particular type of engagement in communities. Okay, so we know for, you know, since the late 80s, early 90s, and Rob Schumer's here, there's a number of people at this university who are excellent experts in this whole area of service learning, community engagement. What I want to argue is that there's something unique in the terms of the potential of good volunteer work. We all know that all volunteer work is not the same. But in, in community engagement, we need to think seriously about the qualities of volunteer work that enhance the kinds of democratic capacities we would want in a younger generation, okay? And so out of, um, out of psychology, there is a theory called contact theory. And I think this is actually a really interesting way to go in the field of service learning, to think about what it is about um, working with a group whose society stereotypes, the homeless, okay, the elderly, okay, those with whom on a daily basis, we do not have regular contact, okay? And the idea about contact theory is that we work with, all of us do, we work with group stereotypes because it's easier to think that way, okay? Even if we would like to get over it, we, we actually live with group stereotypes. And when we have contact with people, real people, from those stereotype groups, it starts us to think about, reflect on the stereotypes we walk around with. So what I want to argue is if, if, if we want to build the stock of social trust, like humanity, people in general, are fair, trustworthy, and helpful, we need to build into the engagement experiences of young people opportunities to act with others who are not like them, okay? The second thing, and I think it's been underestimated in the, the work on community service and service learning, is that when kids do service, they're typically working in human service organizations. And most of you know that people do not go into human service work to get rich. Um, they do it because they believe in what, what they're doing is of benefit to others in their community, okay? So even the opportunity to be with adults who have dedicated their lives to human service is probably an opportunity for young people to think about, not only think about what they might do with their lives, but there are people out there in my community who really care about others. 
They're trustworthy, they're fair, they go out of their way to be helpful, okay, even to their own financial sacrifice. So two areas I think that we, that we ought to be thinking about in terms of volunteer work or community service, I, I know there's distinctions in the literature on what we should really call this, but the, the opportunities for kids to get out of the comfort zone of their own lives, and even in their own clubs, community-based clubs, and interact with others, okay, in their community, I think builds the stock of social trust. And I just draw this from John Dewey's work on the importance of education to democracy. So he, he has a phrase that says, you know, even a band of thieves uh, has a strong sense of solidarity. So it can't just be group friendship or solidarity that's building democracy, okay? Because antisocial groups um, also are pretty solid. So with the kinds of questions we need to ask about what engagement opportunities young people are having, he phrases this way. So if you're in a group, can you say to yourself, how numerous and varied are the interests of those people in the group which they talk about, he used, has consciously shared. Do they talk about stuff that doesn't just happen in the group? You know, I met so-and-so and say, I went here, okay? So that within the group, even if they're very similar, within the group, there's a chance to talk about other things, okay, outside of the group. And how full and free is the interplay with other people outside the group? So it's not just this club that I'm in, but I'm in other things that have different interests. And when I come to this club, what comes with me is my experiences in those other places, okay? So again, if you think about homogeneity or heterogeneity of experience, and that social trust is enhanced by meeting lots of diverse other people, um, what, what Dewey is really talking about here is we build democracy by making sure we don't just have very homogeneous experiences. Now, this is a very simple study in which uh, we ask the young people, okay, what kinds of groups are you in? Okay, do you, are you in any clubs at school, after school? Do you do any volunteer work in the community at school, after school? So this is a simplification of those kinds of questions on the bars. And then what the uh, little legend is talking about is their perceptions of people in their community. So it's a number of scales which say, yeah, generally, people in my community care about others. People in my community pitch in. People in my community care about the, how others are doing, not just themselves, okay? So you can see the resonance to the social trust theme. People, the open thing, I think, is a really important scale. People in my community welcome newcomers even if they're different from us, because in Pennsylvania and a lot of other places, as you know very well, there are many newcomers diversifying the, what the concept of community. So we felt it was important not just to talk about solidarity within, but openness to others on the outside. And effectiveness is people in my community can get things done. So the first thing you can see is that the, the clubs, the, the, the kids who do nothing, the kids who say that I'm not in any clubs, I don't do any volunteer work. It's hard to believe, that, but there are plenty of kids out there actually not uh, incorporated into anything, are less likely than others to say their community is caring, open, and effective. We also actually have scales about the police, incidentally, and um, although, although the scales on the police and whether uh, uh, they treat everybody fairly are much lower than these other things. So actually, <laughs> I didn't even put them up there. Uh, there, are, there are differences between groups in terms of the opportunities kids have to incorporate. But the big difference is, so, so on the left side of the graph, what you can see is kids who are in clubs and do volunteer work and kids who didn't say they were in any clubs but did some sort of volunteer work, okay? And the, and the important message here is that when you say you've done some volunteer work, you are more likely than even just being in clubs. So our 4-H groups or our boys and girls clubs, if they're not also doing some sort of volunteer engagement, are not producing the kinds of kids who say their community, people in their community are people I wanna be like, okay? People who care about others, people who are open uh, to newcomers, and people who can get things done. I'm sorry this is not a great quality, and the, but the only point I want to, um, emphasize here, this is, a three, this is three waves, three time points across three years. So it's the same adolescence, all right? 
And this is, this is the, the um, developmental change in social trust. So probably you could have predicted that from age 11 to age 15, there would be a decline in your positive beliefs about humanity, and you'd be right. But the point, the main point I want to make here is that the pink line is also showing the same kids over time, but these are the kids who at least at one point said they engaged in volunteer work. So the message of this slide is that although with age, kids' beliefs about whether others can be trusted tend to go down, okay? And that might just be the wider range of others that they're in contact with and they haven't had a chance to think through with adults or with other youth why those groups shouldn't be stereotyped. Um, but, but what we would say is that the, the, the opportunity to do volunteer work moderates this natural age-related decline, okay, in, in social trust. All right, let's just move on to the notion of others and a little bit more about who the bad crowd is. So I'm worried about your brother lately. He's hanging out with the wrong crowd. I think one thing I want to do <laughs> at the end of my career is get rid of the idea that there is a wrong crowd. <laughs> Work hard to think through why we so easily adopt that concept. So what I want to use this slide to talk about is um, contact theory and why volunteer work has the potential. I want to emphasize it's not inevitable. So doing volunteer work can actually uh, uh, solidify or intensify group stereotypes. I worked with an extension educator who said uh, she worked with a young girl who didn't want to go back to the nursing home. She really didn't like it. So importantly, it's not inevitable that when you have contact, it will undo your stereotypes, okay? What is important, again, is I think the role of adults in helping kids unpack what their experience was. But these are just the kids' statements. So all we asked them was, if you did volunteer work in your community, can you just tell us what you learned from that experience? And we didn't say, you know, we didn't put it in any categories. So these are their words. I used to be afraid of the elder elderly. I understand them more and found out they're really nice. <laughs> I, I was astonished at how much the elderly, there's a stereotype about the elderly among young people. I had no idea. And yet over and over and over again, we hear old people are actually kind of nice. <laughs> um, just because someone is old, you don't have to be frightened of them, okay? A lot of people in the nursing homes aren't really mean, they're just lonely. So th these are their own words at ways in which contact with real people. I mean, who'd have guessed that was a stereotype group? I didn't think that. Um, but they're saying to themselves, what I learned from doing this volunteer work is they're not so bad. <laughs> and, and what I want to argue with, with a few more slides is there's been a debate in the uh, literature on service about whether it's only charity work and therefore apolitical, okay? Uh, and some of it can be. But what I want to emphasize is that by doing it and by having a chance to interact with people for whom policies really matter, teenagers are beginning to see the world from their point of view. You know, there's that famous phrase about walking in someone's shoes, okay? It's not inevitable that you'll think about policy, but it's a huge opportunity, again, for adults to say, well, yeah, why do we have nursing homes? How do we fund them? Why is it that people are there and not in the community? Okay, so to have those kinds of conversations that are highly relevant to politics and policy, I think service is a huge opportunity, okay? So I learned that not all, all the people who attend a soup kitchen are actually homeless. Again, that's probably a very common stereotype. The reason you're there is you're homeless. Some are old people who can't survive on Social Security, okay? Now, how many 10 or 12 year year olds or 13 or 14, have you had a conversation about Social Security with? So their opportunity to be there actually says, oh, there's a system we have here. And it looks like it's not supporting the people that I met at the soup kitchen. Um, and even, even stereotypes about groups you wouldn't think that would necessarily come up. Rich people, it, it, if you live in a rich area, uh, you may not, uh, you, you're not necessarily snobby, okay? Again, I think a stereotype in the sort of reverse direction. And this comes I, from an African-American child. I learned all white people aren't, and I love the way um, he said it, stereo slash types. <laughs> it's a really new way of thinking of stereo um, uh, uh, and its meaning. Um, 
Uh, and then, basically, you get to know people for who they are, not what they are. Uh, you know, nobody was teaching them about contact theory or stereotyping or anything, but these are the kids' own words about what they learn. Um, and people are hurt, they need your moral backup. I just like think these phrases are terrific. Uh, and here, here I want to argue that some of these are telling us that kids actually are beginning to see public issues or public problems, okay? Um, I got the views of people four times my age and saw how they were treated. It helped me see how hard it can be for some kids and some adults if you have disabilities. It taught me how wide the gap is between just the middle class and the poor. I thought, these are amazing. I mean, this person's talking about inequality. This kid is talking about inequality in their own words. I learned how our younger generations are growing up, how everyone has the kind of life to live in a house. There are quite a few poor people, and this is one of the places, Allentown is a, is a community in Pennsylvania. I didn't realize there were poor people in my own town. Um, and I learned about the treatment of the elderly, and I see what people get angry about. What motivates people to get active in politics is often that they think social injustice is happening. So these are kids saying from their own experience of volunteer work, and as mild as it might be, I think a sort of budding political awareness. And here, here I want to argue, to come back to the theme, that by being, working together, I, I, I actually have a really strong prejudice that kids should not do service alone. They should do it in a group, and they should then unpack with the people in the group, what did we do and how did we do it? Because uh, achieving public change, achieving social change, or achieving any kind of political change, except for someone like Bill Gates, it's really hard for most of us to achieve political change unless we work together. So what I want to argue is that we really ought to be thinking in our volunteer work about how they develop a sense of we the people. We got this done together and the power of collective work. So they say things like, uh, there are nice, considerate people out there that could still believe someone after they have done wrong. This is actually a kid who's doing service because they're mandated by the court to do it. Okay, so this kid is saying, Gee, um, even though a lot of people think I'm not trustworthy, when I did this service, these nice people actually gave me the benefit of the doubt, okay? Um, and there's still people out there like that. So it's clear that this kid has not become hardened because uh, he's had a chance to uh, restore justice to the community and restore his reputation. Um, and, and again, I learned that by helping people, you'll receive many rewards, particularly respect, okay? that because we youth were out there doing something, those members of our community respect us, the youth. I grew closer to people at school and realized that uh, team efforts make a difference. If you work together, you can get things done. In order to achieve things, everyone must work together. It helps to me to bond with others, and, and they help me to see myself. So I just think this sort of notion that we the people is something kids can begin to articulate in their own ways by having collective experiences of achieving something together in their community. Um, uh, you help others now, and when you need it, it will be there for you. So I, I mean, my program of work is called Kids' Understanding of the Social Contract, and what I love is that they see that this is something that comes back to you because you've made a contribution. It'll be there when you need it. Now, this was for Bob Schumer, who was telling me uh, just before the presentation about uh, concerns about uh, whether all kids are having opportunities for engaging with their community and who's getting left out. There are a number of studies now showing that within schools, within community-based organizations, there's huge variability by social class as to what the opportunities for engagement are. Even within the same school, Joe Kahn in California has done some studies of, within the same school, kids who are ability grouped in the lower classes have fewer civic opportunities than those within the very same school. But across communities that vary in terms of um, both their financial but also their human capital. So a lot of, as you know, youth-based organizations require volunteers. And Dan Hart has done some really interesting work in what he calls child-saturated communities. So to the extent that the adult-child ratio 
um, is, is lower. There are fewer adults for children in poor communities. You have fewer volunteers. I mean, that also adds on to the stress level and everything else, but just the simple fact of how many adults are there for how many kids means that there's unequal opportunities for engagement. This is a chart that comes from Monitoring the Future, which is a national uh, trend study of high school seniors that's been going on since the mid-70s. And what it shows, the red line, well, the, the, you, they asked the kids in high school, do you expect to be going to college next year or not, okay? So the blue line is the kids who in high school say, you know, no, I'm not expecting to go into college, and the red line is th those who are. And there's one question which says, and has been asked, the wonderful thing about trend studies is that people had the foresight to say, gee, we should ask these kinds of questions. So they have one question talking about how, how often you participate in community affairs on a monthly basis, okay? So what you're seeing here, I mean, the trend line for the, red ki the kids in red is from the early 90s when all of you know service learning has become very much institutionalized in schools. Um, and some people argue it's increasingly needed to get into college because if you, unless you can show that you're a well-rounded good citizen, um, you know, good grades and good scores on SATs are actually not sufficient anymore. So what, what, what this represents in my view is uh, the, the growing class divide in um, opportunities for engagement in community affairs. And, and th this is not the only evidence. There's actually a number of different studies that have shown that it's not just the kids aren't choosing to do this stuff, it's that there really aren't the opportunities or the norms um, being pushed on them to do this stuff. I'll just mention one other um, important point on this, and that it comes from work by um, Sid Verba, Schlossman, and Brady. There's a book called uh, Voice and Equality. They're um, uh, political scientists at Harvard, and it's a study of adults. But the very important point out of this book is this. When they asked a national sample of adults, um, so, do you participate in community affairs? Do you get engaged? Do you vote? Why do you do that? The number one reason people say that they do those things is that somebody asked them to go to the meeting. <laughs> so the notion of normative pressure, or what I, I, I use that movie, Being There, you know that old, uh, what was it, Peter Sellers movie, or what, what, I, you know, just being, the, Chauncey, whatever his name was, being there is actually a hugely important reason that we get engaged. So it's not surprising that there's a, been a number of studies that show that kids who are in 4-H or in community-based organizations, when they're adults, they vote more so than kids who weren't in those things. When they're adults, they're participating in their community. I think the mechanism that's happening there is that you continue to select in places where being there means you get asked, okay? So if you're in 4-H, and even if you don't continue, you probably do something else because you know other people who ask you to join another organization. And that kind, of, uh, that kind of connection just in organizations matters. So the important thing here is we need to be thinking of a, as a society that it can't just be college that's the opportunity for young adults to engage. There's plenty of opportunities for engagement in college, but those who don't go on to college, there's a huge institutional lacuna there. That It used to be trade unions that could, would be a mechanism, but the membership in those, as you all know, has been declining precipitously. So we really need to think about, there, there's some evidence coming out that community colleges really matter, but everybody doesn't go to them either. And what's hugely important, as you know, is there's disproportionate numbers of newcomers, ethnic minorities, new immigrants, who are in the group that's not going on to college. So to bring it back to democracy, unless we're sure we're making these opportunities for engagement equal opportunities, we are not building um, democracy. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly go through these. Um, yeah, I should, I should wrap up pretty quickly, right, Ann? Do you help? Oh, okay. Um, this, I, I only, th th this is, I just want to briefly introduce the stereotype about institutions and whether they're safe and why we need to get over uh, this, th this idea that everything's worse than it used to be, okay? I, ju th this, is, this just came from um, Gallup poll data that was, uh, happened to be in the Seattle Times. Just look at the public schools thing for a second. So this is comparing 1979 national data to 2008. And what it's saying is, uh, how confident are you, okay, that these institutions um, uh, are, are, are trustworthy institutions, okay? So what it's talking about is a crisis of confidence, which actually President Carter in the 70s 
talked about uh, his worry that there was a general crisis in confidence, but what these data say is, if anything, our belief in the trustworthiness of institutions is worse than it used to be. And what I want to present to you is why that matters for everyday life in terms of ju uh, just to look at uh, parent-teacher relationships. So in, in our most recent study, we asked the parents in this study to tell us, thinking about when you were young, um, would you say the following institutions are more or less secure, safe, or trustworthy, or about the same as when you were young? And I'm not going to present the data on all of them. It varies in terms of their comparison basis. I'm just going to focus here on schools and whether the parents say schools, that's in general, are more or less trustworthy, safe, or secure. You should know that schools actually are more safe and secure <laughs> than they used to be, despite uh, popular stereotypes. So uh, the green bar is those who either say, uh, who say schools are much less trustworthy or somewhat less trustworthy than I was a kid. And the three, fours, and fives are, it's the same, they're the same as they were when I was a kid, or they're even better. So what you can first see is that 63% and the, so it's 600 parents, okay? 63% of our sample actually felt things were worse than when they were a kid in terms of the trustworthiness and safety of schools. Now, the main point I want to emphasize is that this affects their perceptions of their kids' school, okay? And their relationships with teachers. And ultimately, what we really want to make sure is that the communication between parents, students, and teachers flows um, and that there's trust on all sides. So then we asked these same parents a set of scales, and we asked the kids these things too. So about the school your child currently attends, and these are one to five, you know, disagree, agree scales. And then we have a number of items that get at um, uh, the administration at this school is responsive to parents' concerns. So I can go there and they'll listen to me, and a number of items tapping that. Uh, there's a good sense of school spirit. Kids feel like they're wanted, like they're an important part of the school, and adults my child can go to and talk to at that school. Now, I want to emphasize, we looked at whether these kids were bullied, uh, whether uh, the kids felt that teachers played preferences, all the things that one might feel are real evidence that kids are getting, certain kids are not getting treated as fairly as others. We couldn't find anything that said the parents who didn't trust schools had kids whose situation was worse, okay? But what you see here, and th th this is just a shorthand, that these are the parents who said schools have gotten worse than when I was a kid in terms of their safety, security. They are much less likely, these are significant differences, to feel that authorities at their kid's school are responsive. At their school, kids feel like an important part of the school, and at their kid's school, adults would be responsive to their kid's needs. This is, this is already figuring out whether there's anything going wrong for their individual kids that we could ferret out from the kids' data. Um, so the argument here is that these prevailing stereotypes about the institutions of our society um, uh, are harming relationships probably at the individual and interpersonal level and that we should, I mean, they're, first of all, many of them are not true. Certainly on schools, they're not true. We should somehow work at eradicating these beliefs um, uh, about, uh, about schools. This is just getting back to the same time, 2002 uh, magazine that um, I started with the baby picture. So this is a teenager. Um, out in the middle of an ocean, and if you can see it in the distance, there's this huge ocean liner that he's trying desperately to flag down. Um, but again, you know, it captures what time felt, was this sense of being all alone in this vast sea um, and figuring out your own way. Um, and I want to just end with a couple of these quotes. So in 1987, Margaret Thatcher gave this interview, actually, I think it was to a women's magazine, and I just really love this quote about uh, about the privatization of risk. Um, I think we've gone through a period when too many children and people have been given to understand I have a problem, it's the government's job to cope with it. I have a problem, I'll go and get a grant to cope with it. Or I'm homeless, the government should uh, uh, house me. And, and so, so then she said this and was really embarrassed that she did. And so they're casting their problems on society. And what is society? There is no such thing. <laughs> there are individual men and women, and there are families, and no government can do anything except through people, and people 
must look to themselves first. So this is just representing sort of the extreme of the privatization that we're not all in this together. Um, and um, here I just want to end with two more slides. So this again is a little bit old because you may not even remember SARS anymore or mad cow disease, but um, several years ago these were the fears that were being promulgated on, on TV about what we should all worry about. But essentially uh, the point here is if we wanted to pay attention all the time to what's scary and produces anxiety, there's plenty of stuff out there for us to think about, okay? Getting together and engaging with other people in our community means our attention is not on those things and it's on solving the problems that we actually share. Um, and figuring out that in fact we can do something together about them rather than sitting around you know, looking at survivalist TV. So I just want to end with this last thing to bring the theme back to why social trust is so necessary to thinking about our collective future. This comes from someone um, C. Douglas Lummis, who wrote a book called Radical Democracy. And he, he really captured for me this sense of public hope because we really don't talk about it a lot. But he, he also captured the whole notion of why we need to trust and, and, and on what basis should we be developing trust. So he says that trust and trustworthiness were invented as a way of dealing with the uncertainties of human beings in a way because they're free. <laughs> I mean, it's our freedom that in many ways makes uh, how we act uncertain. Democratic faith is the decision to believe that a world of democratic trust is possible because we see it in each person sometimes, not always, but there are plenty of times when we could look at the behavior of others and say, yeah, that's really trustworthy. And paying attention to those times is important. Democratic faith is the decision to believe in what people can be on the basis of what they are sometimes. None of this has been proved, but neither has it been disproved. And we are all free to believe either way. So I thank you.